Wie denkst du, könnten, könntest du und auch andere Einwohner der Stadt mehr dazu beitragen, dass die Mobilität verbessert wird, dass die Luftqualität verbessert wird und dass generell einfach Emissionen reduziert werden? Bueno, casi que restringiría todavía más la entrada de vehículos y circulación de vehículos por la ciudad. Dejarla más a transporte eléctrico, peatonal, bicicleta, poco más. Autos und Fahrräder müsste man noch mal mehr trennen. Das funktioniert nicht auf einer Strecke, meiner Meinung nach. Ja, also zijn nu natuurlijk al heel veel bezig met de ontwikkeling met elektrische auto's. Ja. Dus misschien dat ze ook uh, dat soort dingen toe gaan passen op uh, andere vervoersmiddelen. Incentivaria más eh, los coches eléctricos. Potential vehicle electric. Ja, also es fängt bei jedem irgendwie an. Ne? Also man kann auf jeden Weg irgendwie aufs Auto verzichten, wo es möglich ist. Ähm, ich weiß nicht, wenn es möglich ist, irgendwie mit dem Rad fahren, sonst irgendwie die Öffis benutzen, äh, elektrisches Carsharing. Ja, ulaşım olarak tabii ki trafiğin olmadığı bir şehirde yaşamak isterdim. Çünkü İstanbul trafiğinde özellikle karşıdan karşıya geçiyor. Ee, top taşıma kullanımı artabilir. Ee, metrobüs dolmuş, otobüs yerine elektrikli araç, metro vesaire kullanımı artabilir. Bunun altyapısı sağlanabilir. Böyle olursa çevre, tem çevre temizliğinde sağlanmış olacağını düşünüyorum. Hello, it's lovely to do a virtual welcome to you today. We have the pleasure today of hearing from a global perspective. We'll be hearing from experts and practitioners from continents that only start with A. So we have Australia, Asia, Africa, and the Americas. Um, but we're very lucky today. So the way we'll be working is I will do a short introduction of four speakers, and they will speak for about eight minutes, after which we'll be opening up to a floor discussion. What we'd like each of the speakers today to reflect on, they're going to share what they think is their biggest challenges and the things that are challenging for their country that perhaps might be completely different for Europe and how we're thinking. While we've only started in the IT urban mobility for a full year now, our aspirations are global. So this is where we start today. So with that in mind, I'd like to introduce you to Ian Christensen. Ian Christensen is in a long career in mobility. Previously, he worked for the Centre for Collaborative Research for Automotive Industry in Australia. And now he's the director for what's called iMove. iMove is more or less the Australian um, sister organisation for EIT Urban Mobility. They have about 250 million allocated 50% industry, 50% government to work on mobility projects and the future of urban transport. So with that, we will hand over now to Ian. Thank you, Gareth, and greetings, everyone. Uh, for context, uh, iMove is, in fact, a, a more or less a platform to encourage uh, stakeholders in the mobility community to collaborate in ways to embrace new technology that will improve the movement of people and freight. Because of that, we cover a very wide perspective, or we have a very wide perspective on urban mobility. And today, I'd like to focus on the few things that are, folk, that are uh, attracting most of our attention. Next. Next slide, perhaps. Ah, there we go. Uh, so the first, first amongst our areas of focus is flexible transport. So sometimes, in some places it goes under the name of mobility as a service. In other places, it's mobility on demand. Um, but the point for us is that the community is, is anxious to get a better service for the same cost that it currently incurs. And for this reason, uh, there, is, there is a widely held perspective in Australia that our, our fixed route uh, public transport services are frequently um, inefficient and suboptimal. But the question is how to replace it or what to replace it with. So there is a lot of work going on in, uh, in the different cities in Australia to experiment with different ways of doing things. So that includes on-demand bus services, feeder services to trunk routes, um, uh, uh, packaging of different sorts of transport options into transport wallets and, and the like. Um, 
no, but no city has yet sort of fully established uh, mobility as a service, as a, as a standard offering, but the, the level of interest and development is very strong. So next slide. The second area that we're, we're strongly focused on is connection and, automa and automation or connectivity and automation. In Australia, because we've now lost our car industry, our primary focus actually is on connectivity. And we believe that connectivity actually will, will drive bigger benefits and faster benefits to the local community, in fact, than automation will. That's partly because connectivity can be provided to people uh, through retrofitting of existing vehicles. And in fact, one of our projects underway at the moment is a, is a very large scale trial. 500 vehicles, private vehicles, have been retrofitted with connectivity devices that then enables the drivers to receive real time warnings of, for a whole variety of risk factors. So connectivity is, is coming strongly, but we, we don't ignore automation. Uh, we have access to quite a number of fully automated vehicles. Uh, we're just learning how to drive them at the moment. Well, I don't know if, if, if learning how to drive an automated vehicle is, is not a, a, a contradiction. Perhaps more, more importantly, we're trying to understand what level of infrastructure support that automated vehicles will require or what level of you know, uh, uh, lines and signs we need to have available to maximize the penetration of these new technologies. So next slide. The third area that we're focused on is networks and everybody wants the, the network to perform better. The trouble is nobody can ag quite agree on what a better performing network really means. And some people focus on the, the road network and other people focus on the public transport network and other people focus on the bus network and the train network. And, and our challenge is how to, to build a perspective across all of these networks in a way that delivers uh, an improved performance for everyone. Now that, that's a bit complicated, but our first focus there is actually to do something about the, the demand pattern. And in particular, we're, we're looking to find ways to reduce peak demand. So the morning peak and the evening peaks because it's the peaks that give us the most problem. Perhaps a little more, more under the surface but and hidden from public view, but another, another problem that we're trying to address on our networks is, is to balance the the demand for road space or demand for space on the network from both the passenger and the freight operations. Um, both, both operations are important, but uh, and unless we can uh, manage the access to the network in a slightly better way, they, they run the risk of tripping over each other. So network, network uh, operations management, network demand management and network performance measurement uh, are key areas of current endeavor. Then to the next slide. So to finish, I'd like to mention, talk about some of the challenges that we are meeting as we address these issues of flexible transport, network performance, connectivity and automation. And the first of these challenges is data, data sharing, data exchange, data standards, uh, we're, we're all at sea when it comes to data. Um, and we, we have lots of it, but it's very seldom can one bit of data be adequately compared with another bit. And it's also impossible to uh, aggregate them. So we're looking, we're looking around the world for people who have achieved great, great progress in data sharing, data standardization, uh, or any, any manner of data manipulation in a way that improves decision-making in the mobility sector. We also have, you know, we also wrestle with questions of governance. Um, in Australia, we have three tiers of government. We have a national government, we have state governments, and we have local governments, and they all have responsibilities for transport. So 
needed to say we spend a fair amount of time trying to sort out who is going to do what. And then last, the last challenge I want to just touch on, and um, we might come back to it later in the discussion, but it's COVID. Now, COVID has been causing deep trouble for communities all around the world and is still doing so. But we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that COVID has also shown us some, some wholly new opportunities. And in particular, when I, I refer to the way COVID has changed our work behavior, it's changed our travel behavior, it's changed somewhat for the worse, our confidence in public transport, and it's increased the emphasis on community mobility. And our challenge in Australia is to learn from these uh, behavioral changes that the community has adopted to see how we can better, um, how, how we can apply some of the, the better aspects of these changes uh, to the, uh, the urban mobility landscape in a way that's permanent. So I think there are a lot of things there that uh, you know, probably resonate in Europe and, in, and potentially around the world. Um, let's see how we can work together to find some progress on them. Thank Thanks. you, Ian. That was a great, great recap. Okay, so we've got a, many of the issues you mentioned. I think we might be hearing some of them again. Um, tomorrow, I'll just put a quick word in. There's a future mobility, which is about digital. We're doing a session on that tomorrow. And some big names from Cisco, Siemens are going to be there. Um, we'll probably talk, touch on that. But right now, we're going to go across the Indian Ocean. And I do want to thank everyone for staying up late or getting up at unusually early hours for today. We're going to talk to uh, Yasmin. So Yasmin Forbes has a long career in the digital sector, working for Microsoft, Oracle, um, HP, but most recently has been working for Transnet, which is the um, government organization which runs road, rail, ports, authorities, etc., in South Africa, and has a long infrastructure all the way through Africa due to the history of South Africa being the main contact point. Um, She's been that, on that board for eight years and has recently just left. And currently she is the lead board member of the Chartered Accountants Association of South Africa in her changing role, but she has great depth of understanding both of the technology and the sector. Yasmin. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna be discussing with you and if they can put the slide up is South Africa's minibus taxi industry. Um, and that is what we call demand responsive transport. And this was born out of exclusion. Now, there was linked to the history of apartheid where there was forced removals from commercial and industrial centers. And that was purely what you call apartheid spatial planning. Um, what has happened is, as you can see, there's about over 15 million commuters today with 200,000 uh, mini taxis. Uh, so 66% of your households are using this transport right now, either to work or, or, or to school. This industry is an informal, in the informal sector. It's operating on basically on the fringe of a formal economy. It generates about 19 billion rand, which is about $6 billion a year per annum. So there's, it's, there's a lot of challenges. It is not supported, was not, it has not been supported by government. So if you look at the subsidies, you would look at the train versus the bus. Bus would get about 23%, train would get about nine. The taxes just got about 1%. So what happened within this industry, they had to thrive with minimal structure support and the demand exceeded the supply because you had people because of special planning all over and had to commute. So this is what happened when they actually just started going into, um, you know, creating this particular industry. So as far as the economics is concerned, they've done and they've thrived, they've got drivers, but it does come with challenges. When you look at how this industry is positioned, it's positioned to make positive impact. However, it is in a situation where there is a need for financial inclusion, because now you have previously excluded from the actual credit providers and the economy are now playing in that space. And the public transport is an integral part because it's a feeder to the bus and the rail systems because people can just get around and get there. Coupled with the fact that there's about 
42,000 small, medium enterprises that fits within these ecosystem and also the sustainability and there's the job creation of people supporting the system. If I go on to the next slide. So what has actually happened? Um, next slide, please. A lot of discussions have taken place um, because of the need. Um, so they're working towards developing a blueprint. This is currently in progress. And what's happened, they have what they call the National Tax Lila Hotla, and that's just where the leaders in the village get together. This happened November this year. And the areas they were looking at, and they're sort of discussing, firstly, is you're looking at professionalization, and they're going, these were issues raised by passengers themselves what they wanted because of the high road fatalities. They were going, we need safer, we need roadworthy vehicles. And also we need to look at people with reduced mobilities. How do we bring them into you know, wheelchairs and things? And coupled with that, a complaint systems and surveys so they know, are they being heard and are things being addressed? The other area which is very critical is the empowerment because we need to look at a model that benefits the operators the drivers and the workers. And this is all that's happening right now. And because they've been operating on the fringe of a formal economy. So, you know, given an informal economy, you know, things just run the way they want to as far as administration is concerned, uh, it becomes competitive, um, people get paid. There's, there's no things like, you know, benefits and things like that. So the other area that is a, a topic for discussion right now is regulation. So it's been 24 years with this new government. However, it's not being transformed. How did the, the taxi industry uh, operate? They couldn't operate. So under the old regime, you could have a large carrier license. And if you had a large carrier license, you apply for the permit. If you had a 10 seater, all you had to do is one seat less and you can have it. And that's how they operated. They looked at what they did at the time and you had the old railway police policing them, but they operated legally. So given that it's spawned into this huge sort of $6 billion sort of like industry, there's a need to transform that. There's a need for regulation. There's a need for structures to support. There's need for benefits for people. And coupled with innovation, with Uber taking place, the e-hailing services is how do we deal with that? How do we manage the routes are not overpopulated? How do we coordinate that? How do we make it safe for people, for women, for kids and things like that? Coupled with that, there's sort of the unity and leadership issue because you're looking at a huge economy. You're looking at, we've survived this far. How do we look at who becomes the leader? So it's very much intertwined. It's sort of like political. And trust me, initially they had this situation that this is going to happen uh, and politics, however government was involved with that. But as we move on going forward to the next slide, what we have to do is what has emerged out of these discussions and these engagements is there's a need for regular communication amongst all stakeholders. Now, there's a lot of initiatives that's happening. Um, they need to, there's a lot of people that's interested. It ties into the green transport economy. It looks at a lot of issues. And what has happened is when we had the World Cup, that sort of spawned a lot of things because you had the, the bus rapid transport system, whole of cities, and we also have airports that is sort of a small mini airport that is solar generated. So you have a lot of initiatives all over. So what is really important right now is to look and say, how do they collectively create the impact? And what they need to look at is to say, let's look at a sharing platform, look at a more of a harmonized approach and a lot of the issues because things are happening in silos. However, it is happening everywhere. And given the fact that the challenges you have with COVID, what we found that technology was able, everybody's got the smartphone, you could just flip on the president's on, you talk about there's an app that follows. So it is an enabler. And as Africa has the huge and quick adoption to mobility, there's a lot stacked in our favor where we can go ahead and say, let's make that happen. So there's a lot, it's a very fragmented approach, but needless to say, there's a lot of things that's that's taking place at the moment. Thank you. Thank you, Yasmin. I think it's so wonderful that we, we can hear how far advanced you are in demand response of transport compared to Europe, for example, where we are rolling out demand responsive in some of our cities. We've had it rural for a while, but now we're starting to see it's actually what people want and we have to find a way to manage it, control it and ensure it's managed. But there's lots that we can share. So it's lovely to hear that message. Maybe you can help us. So now we're going to cross over Indian Ocean and the Pacific. 
Good morning, Adam. It's early. I hope you've had your coffee and you're ready to share with us a little bit today. So, Adam, just so you're Good aware, you've been, you've been 14, 15 years at Berkeley, yeah? University of California, Berkeley. And um, yeah. at the same time, is leading a senior researcher in their future mobility group. He's also been advising the, um, the, the US, it's your transport research board, I think. It's like it's a big research funding organization that have multiple divisions and we had a chance to meet with them. Um, and you've been working with them on different panels. And I think the one that is the, the, the equality and innovative mobility is the one that you're leading, the coordinating team. Perfect. So you've got a lot to share with us. So we happily hand over to you now. Right. Good morning, Gareth. And, and thank you for the opportunity uh, to speak. And actually I should say, say good afternoon and good evening for, for everybody that's joining kind of around the world. Um, you know, I'm excited to really kind of share, I think, what we, what's going on from the North American and, and particularly the U.S. context. Um, you know, Ian started off by talking about kind of mobility on demand and mobility as a service. And, you know, one of the things that is unique about the U.S. context is that, you know, um, this idea that kind of transportation is a commodity and that consumers can really make decisions based on their mobility um, or not to, to, to, to do mobility, you know, have things delivered, um, whether, it be, whether it be physically or digitally, based on a variety of factors, such as, um, you know, travel time, how much it costs, and, and other types of economic factors. And so this was a kind of an idea that really started to gain traction about 15 years, and I think it's really kind of reinvented itself in light of COVID, because, you know, we had long talked about, you know, how, you um, how mod included kind of goods delivery and even digital delivery, but with with COVID, it's kind of really a kind of re-emphasized, you know, the role of goods delivery and telework um, and and digital learning as as a substitute for physical mobility. Um, one of the things I want to talk about today is really some of the challenges that we see um, related to kind of pricing. Um, the role of the built environment and, and some other challenges related to COVID. COVID. Um, in, with respect to kind of mobility on demand and the kind of the privatization of kind of urban mobility in the U.S. context, um, we see a lot of cultural challenges around uh, pricing and, and how these mobility options are priced. Uh, in some cases, you know, pay as you go um, is a little bit more expensive. Um, for example, if you were to go out and use a shared bike or a shared scooter, you know, a couple dollars a trip kind of adds up. And over time, you could go out and actually buy a bike or buy a scooter. But I think it gets down to a really a deeper cultural issue. And that is really in the North American context and, and in particular in the U.S., consumers are really um, kind of wedded to this idea of all you can consume consumption. And, you know, we see it in, you know, um, unlimited cell phone plans. We see it in unlimited Netflix. Um, we see it in all you can eat buffets and free refills. And so, um, you know, U.S. consumers, it's very hard to get them out of this mindset. And it's one of the reasons that they're so wedded to, to the private vehicles is it's the same idea of the all you can consume mentality. Um, and so I think pay per use is, is a bit of a novel concept that is a little bit hard for us to overcome sometimes. Um, in the U.S. context, you know, we see uh, mobility on demand partnerships forming uh, with the public sector um, in a number of different contexts. We see uh, a lot of partnerships around first and last mile uh, connections to public transportation. Um, in both pre and now in light of COVID, we see a lot of renewed interest related to gap filling services whether it be late night or low density service, particularly as public transit has had to reduce their schedules. And then we also see um, efforts at partnerships for paratransit to provide um, access for older adults and people with disabilities that may need some more personalized service. Um, next slide. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the challenges that we see related to the built environment. On the lower right um, is just a figure of seven U.S. cities showing kind of the declines in public transit ridership in light of COVID. And they, they pretty much follow the same trend Ac across the U.S. You know, we're down er anywhere from 60 to 90 percent, typically on average about 70 to 80 percent in terms of 
public transit ridership compared to pre-COVID levels. Um, and this kind of presents a number of different challenges. Um, and then um, the figure right above it kind of just kind of gets back to this idea of the built environment. And so we did this work for the U.S. Department of Transportation, really trying to illustrate, you know, how mobility varies across urban, suburban, um, exurban, and rural areas. And then we have this, this kind of type of built environment called edge cities, which are kind of denser, but they're still really auto-oriented and not very walkable. Um, and so this kind of presents a lot of challenges, and I think this is emblematic of, of similar built environments that we see elsewhere in the developed world. The difference is in the U.S. is that those city centers are a lot smaller and a lot less dense, um, typically, than what we see either in Europe or in Asia. Um, and what COVID has really done is it's really kind of renewed interest in suburban and exurban living, which presents a number of, I think, challenges going forward um, from the U.S. context. So just a little bit of data from um, the National Association of Realtors, you know, as of September, you know, existing home sales were on the rise and new home sales were up over 43%. Now, there has been some recent um, pullback in that, but the pullback that we've seen on new home sales hasn't been because of change in demand. It's actually a shortage of supply. Um, and, and we see supply constrained going forward because of the big wildfires that we had across the Pacific. Um, we, see, uh, we see a limited supply because of lumber shortages. Um, you know, the National Association of Realtors um, has shown that, you know, telework-ready counties are, are going to be exurban and suburban based on metrics that they've, de they've defined. And we've seen this overall shift because of uh, changes in spending patterns, um, an overall shift to, towards a growth in durable goods, including home buying and car buying. Next slide. So um, we see a lot of unanswered questions going forward, um, you know, based on COVID, you know, we're not really sure how the health and economic crisis is going to have long-term impacts on consumer behavior. Um, we see the potential for de-urbanization um, and, some, and some concerns about, um, you know, the, the vitality of our urban centers. And in light of public transportation, um, you know, how do we rebuild trust and confidence in public transit? And what do we need to do in the interim to keep it fiscally solvent? Um, and as public transit recovers, when is it appropriate to reduce social distancing um, and to kind of pull back possibly some of those personal protective measures that are currently in place? Um, next slide. So with that being said, um, you know, I'd like to, you know, just kind of um, thank, you know, the opportunity to be able to, to speak, you know, today. And I've included on the next slide just kind of some additional resources um, as well as uh, my contact information. And I'd like to thank you again. Hey, thank you very much, Adam. There's uh, lots of similar messages on, on COVID impact that we're looking at. And um, specifically that, that question about the built environment and some of Europe's discussion on creating the 15 minute city. I think in Melbourne, they call it the 20 minute city. So hopefully we'll be able to raise those and have a chance to chat. So our last and not least speaker is going to just cross the ocean from you to Japan. So uh, Takiko Nagumo, he's the Senior Managing Executive of Mitsubishi Research. They provide research to clients in Japan, but also the bank itself and other partners. And um, they have a lot of interaction with government and local government too. And most recently, um, Tak has been the founder of the Smart City Institute Japan which is going to try and bring some of those disparate activities coming together. And one of the areas that they would be looking at is mobility. Okay, So we're more than welcome. And, and importantly, um, Takahito has been over in Europe recently, and he's now a, a lecturer. Um, and I think it's Tallinn Tech University as well. That's where you are. And, and also in Melbourne, the city of Melbourne, and RMIT gave you a, a position there as, as a guest lecturer. So you're all over Europe all over the world. Give us an insight from what's happening in Japan. All right, thank you very much. Thank you for the kind introduction, Gareth. And uh, uh, hello to everyone around the world. And I'm happy to share with you where we stand at Japan. Uh, next uh, slide, please. So this is a little bit a busy picture, though, but I want to uh, direct your attention to this uh, busy map. 
the, this is the, some of the distorted map of Japan indicating uh, the various digital solution projects taking place across Japan. And uh, what we faced today was that the fragmentation of the digital solutions project taking place across in Japan. So let's say you can see the uh, purple bubble, which indic indicate the smart mobility project taking place in the various parts of Japan, but there are no interoperability amongst those projects, even though they are falling into same mobility projects. The data sets are different, data architectures are different, there's no interconnectivity whatsoever. And the different shapes represent different digital solutions. Uh, you can name it as uh, the education, so healthcare, or energy, or ecology, and so forth. Again, uh, amongst those uh, uh, digital solutions, we didn't have the interoperability readily available. So the facing this crisis situation, what we prioritized first was the standardization. If you don't really standardize the data architecture, there's no use for useful uh, uh, digital transformation, uh, mobility, whatsoever you, you name it. So uh, the probably Japan is known for coordination culture. I think that's kicking in right now. Next page, please. And the second uh, important element with regard to the COVID-19 reaction was the, the acceleration of the uh, legislative uh, process and, and the regulatory reform. So living in the old regime, legal regime, doesn't really gives us the chance to survive. So Japanese government accelerated the legislative uh, processes and the regulatory uh, processes to make all the legal systems suitable for the digital age. And uh, uh, the, uh, we had very old legal systems uh, suitable for the industrial age. And we were not really concerned about it before the COVID-19, but that's the, now the central issue. Uh, we were paper heavy to begin with, with the stamps, as you know, the Japanese culture, not a signature. So that's all eliminated in the public sector right now. So everything is now online. Starting from that easy end, we are moving on to data-oriented society. And uh, next, uh, next page, please. And uh, all in all, what we are trying to accomplish right now is to implement something called Super City Initiative, which is beyond some smart city initiatives. Uh, we, what, did, uh, what the point of this is that the, uh, the Super City will be named uh, towards the end of this fiscal year, which is March uh, 2021, only five to 10 cities will be selected by the government. And those city must implement five digital solutions at the same time with the harmonized digital architecture. So there's a, a interconnectivity with data ensured across these cities. And then they are entitled to oversee a supersede national regulations, so special treatment so all of the uh, obstacles coming from the uh, old legal systems can be overridden. Uh, next page, please. This is a picture of what it is. On the left-hand side, you can see, on the pink side, you can see the solutions as an example, and the blue part as the, the uh, common data exchange layer. So that's the heart of the architecture. Sometimes people call it the city OS. Now it's standardized across Japan. And unless you implement it, you won't be uh, subsidized. You won't be supported by the Japanese government from the uh, super city standpoint. On the right-hand side, you can see another busy map that shows the chaos map of the key players in Japanese industries across smart city uh, domain. So those are now raising hand to collaborate to implement the super city initiative. Okay, next page, please. The finally, this is going to be orchestrated in many ways, domestically and internationally. So the, once the super city model is implemented, it's gonna be disseminated across Japan uh, with the concept of the decentralization of the use of the, of the land in Japan too. Everything is centralized in Japan, which is causing fear for the infection. Now Japanese government shifted the policy towards decentralization of the land use. So we are going to make 100 smart cities across Japan. So it's a drastic change of the 
use of land. And uh, also the digital government initiative will be coordinated with the super city smart city initiative. And uh, those will be standardized and we hope to uh, promote international standardization uh, of this, uh, whatever we can make as a contribution to the rest of the world. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you very much. That's an awful lot of information, but I mean, I think there's a very uh, strong example that you've given us on uh, the role of government coming in and enforcing no subsidies unless you play with the standardized model for data sharing and integration across multiple solutions. I mean, that really would, um, I'm sure some of our partners would have a, a strong uh, opinion on that. And I'm sure we'll be hearing it. And hopefully any questions from our cities who are loving the idea or hating the idea, get your question in now. Um, so we've got, uh, I apologize, we're only going to have about um, 20 minutes max to chat. Now, um, we'll be having some questions fielded that we'll be able to answer. But the first and most important one I want to talk about is international cooperation. You know fine well that we have a remit which is beyond um, Europe. And we believe that we've got opportunities to support and share. And we can, under our rules, actually have non-European partners within a consortium if it is seen to be of specific value and added value and interest to us. And I do understand that in Australia, you also have opportunities where you could also demonstrate externally. Is that the case? Yeah. Yes, so in Australia, we are, we're encouraged to uh, look overseas to other countries for uh, leading examples, for opportunities to learn, for, for um, uh, opportunities to collaborate on, shall we say, joint development. Everybody worries about who, where the money is going to go, but nonetheless, the, the, the uh, underlying incentive is to reach out, make the connections and to collaborate and to learn uh, to learn from other people's experience as best we can. Okay. So we would um, obviously have to have a chat because there's lots of processes and rules you'll have to follow in Australia, we'll have to follow in Europe. But I'm sure there's ways that we can find to cooperate. When it comes to um, working with, with Japan or Africa, is there any programs that come to your mind for ways that we could cooperate? Back, anything that comes to your mind that would give us avenues to work Yes, so there are multiple uh, initiatives we are now discussing in Japan for the international collaborations. Uh, first of all, is the uh, uh, national security standpoint. Uh, the use of data must be uh, human-centered, not for the authoritarian purposes or not purely only for the business purposes, it's more of the public social, uh, you know, the material, uh, so to speak. So I think it's gonna be very important to collaborate internationally with the countries who, which has the similar uh, philosophy behind. So Australia, uh, South Africa, Europe, those are the allies for this end. And also the scaling of the digital model is very important. So once you make the digital model, you know, implementing this very small location doesn't really make sense from business standpoint. So we would like to share with you all of the, uh, the business models we created and expand in many places at the same time. I think it's the business purposes. Okay, so that's a wonderful offer that you've made. I think we have a plethora of um, frameworks, uh, toolkits, and decision support tools that are being made across Europe and across Asia and across Australia. Well, we actually perhaps need to dedicate our money to, to more implementation and testing rapidly and borrowing from each other. I think that would be a strong point to be able to ensure our money in these difficult times of COVID goes further by using similar models and, and working together. From Africa, Yasmin, um, situation, uh, we realize that South African economy is a little bit tested recently, but is there still support and funding or do you look to international agencies to support you in your work? Um, there, when it comes to funding, there is, but the way things are very siloed because, you know, sitting in academia, 
you'll see there's a lot of relationships and partnerships all over the world. Um, but it seems to be a common thread happening all over the world right now is that everything is so siloed. And I like the opening when the CEO uh, Maria stated, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go further, you want to go, you know, go together. But right now it's fast and together. So to me, it's a matter of how do we, and I think because of the pandemic, it has, it has given you the, it's the reality that we're all in this, no matter what part of the world it is, and technology is enabling this, it's removing the barriers. So to me, it is looking at how we can collectively create the impact because it's the different layers. You've got the academia, you've got the private, you've got the community engagement, and then you've got the government, national and local, and then you have to try and eliminate the politics to ensure that it has the impact. So I think the advantage of where we find ourselves in the pandemic is the focus on people and to leverage that right now as a collective and say, you know, because I, I, I you know, I, I was busy talking about digital transformation and there was the Japanese um, prime minister that wanted this super genius society in this industry 5.0. Um, and, and to me, there's the pockets of it. And it's up to us to be the enablers, you know, to say, how do we make this happen? Because in the case of the South African minibus, the taxi system industry right now, it is functioned and it is successful. It's made money but in an informal sector. And it's trying to put that into uh, regulation and deal with people that have been dealing with things and surviving. So it's ensuring that that transition to ensure the betterment of everybody and pandemic, green economy. I think the timing is right and it's getting the right players around the table and being the collective. To me, I think we should do that. But just so you're aware and the new programs now, obviously we love supporting all of our partners and projects. But EIT, Urban Mobility, is one of the junior EITs. You know, we have a smaller budget. So what we'll be looking at this year is other ways that we can help our partner community to look to other programs such as uh, the, the Green Deal, which does have a section for Africa. Okay? And then there's also the Digital Europe, which is a, an area which has got some wonderful content on smart cities or applications and specifically talks multiple times about urban mobility. So while our budgets are growing, but there's a need right now, there might be multiple options for us to cooperate um, through other European mechanisms and schemes. And I think we need to keep that in mind. Okay. Yeah. Um, Adam, from your side, so the, the Technologies Research Bureau, it, it's, it's mostly only funding American actions in America, is that correct? Or is that mixed? International well, not, necess not necessarily. I mean, there's a, a couple different funding sources that we see in, in the U.S. context. You know, in the U.S., the Federal Transit Administration um, has funded a number of demonstration programs to test, um, you know, public transit partnerships as well as technologies. So, you know, we've been actively involved in the Mobility On Demand Sandbox. Um, which includes 11 grantees. They're in the process of kicking off um, accelerating innovative mobility known as AIM and the Innovative Mobility Initiative, IMI, um, which are funding uh, 50 different grantees across the U.S. as well as um, one territory. So, um, so that's a common funding mechanism, but we also see a lot of local uh, public transit agencies doing this on their own you know, where, where they are doing um, partnerships or subsidizing programs. So I think there's a, a number of different funding options, um, you know, that are available. Okay, so I think that it would be wonderful if we could get one day to the point where we could align ourselves with some key themes that we could all agree and maybe have a joint call. But that would be a little way away. I think if anything, we might look this year, if we can find a way to align on the call that we all have our own money and funds and maybe have comparisons, that might be an opportunity for us to do that easy introduction to cooperation. And importantly, our, our timing, just so you're aware of our timing for a call, it's likely to come out now, latest news, uh, it's likely to come out about um, end of March, April. So a little bit more delayed due to the rise in Europe, new financial perspective and the negotiations. And um, so that does give us a little bit more time to see if we can find a way to align. And that would be for projects that would start on the 1st of January, 2022. Okay, 
So currently the themes, just so that everybody's aware and our guests that are viewing this, we've chosen to work with active mobility, mobility and energy, sustainable city logistics, and uh, future mobility, which is the digital aspect. And we have our special city club, which is going to be working on creating public realm. Okay, so that's five themes that we've chosen for this coming year, um, which are going to be exciting. We're, just so you're aware, we'll be having a series of networking events, um, state-of-the-art presentations coming up that will help everybody to try and establish that common ground. It'd be wonderful if, if you would want to be part of that as well. Mm -hmm. So I, I just need to check. Do we have any questions coming from the floor? Um, Emma's going to quickly type up anything there so we can see what's happening. Okay, so quick question then on, on COVID. So you two of you have mentioned COVID specifically. So you, we've seen ridership die by about 80% across our cities. So what type of actions are each of you taking in your countries to instill confidence and bring people back? Um, are there big subsidies for those companies involved? You know, I think in Melbourne, you had quite a severe lockdown compared to many other parts of the world. And um, what's happening there? Yeah, so uh, public transport was hit very hard. Um, partly by the, the, the pandemic itself and, and secondly by the lockdown, which prevented anybody from traveling at all. Um, but the, the good outcome from the lockdown is that the, the level of virus in the community has, has been squeezed down to, to, to almost non-existent levels, uh, meaning that uh, people's anxiety about infection uh, from being in close proximity on public transport is is falling away quite rapidly, and and so it, it it's a not a very clever answer, but and one answer to your your proposition is so get rid of the virus, and then people's confidence in public transport will rebound uh, rather quickly. But you know that's easy easy for me to say. It's it's not so easy to do. Um, in in cities where where the, there is a lot of virus at present. Uh, the, the, the issue is, is confidence, people's confidence in the safety of the public transport. And that ultimately means that spacing has to be maintained at a high level, which means capacity is reduced and all, all the PPE protection is going to be required. So it, it's, it's quite onerous and it's possible, but it, whilst there's a lot of virus around, it's going to be difficult to restore public transport activity to the to the levels that it, it was before before the pandemic is struck. So Tag, what's happening in, in, in Tokyo? Your, your famous uh, train system with everybody being pushed on board, ridership has also dropped off? Yeah, good question. So now the Japan is also facing the third wave. So the fear is overriding everyone's mind right now. And uh, as a immediate situation, you know, uh, people ask not to come to the office. You know, people are, uh, you know, accustomed to take a, you know, packed train to commute to the office, but no longer that is sustainable. So stay home and work online. And uh, that's the kind of immediate answer. But uh, the more uh, critically, the Japanese government is moving towards digitalization, not only for the uh, work, but education, uh, the elderly care, the, the, the, the hospitals and the medicine, everything. So the, the Japanese government is now moving towards the enactment of the digital agency. Uh, you know, some countries, countries have already implemented that, uh, you know, the uh, entity, but now we are now accelerating that process. And uh, also uh, I touched upon a little bit earlier, the decentralization. So rather than, you know, centralizing everything in Tokyo, we will disseminate everything in the rural areas. So, you know, enjoy rural life, work online, that's the life. That's the kind of key message. Then lastly, um, the, after the COVID is uh, settled, we need to find out the source of innovation for uh, boosting the economy. So the Japanese government is now moving attention towards the green deal. The green as a source of innovation, that's the, the I think the last one. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I appreciate that. I have to say I, I, we could chat longer, but our time has come to an end. There's a program we need to work through. I'd like to thank Ian, Tack, 
Adam, Yasmin, it's been wonderful to have a chance to chat with you today and see what's happening in the world and hopefully look forward to onward, ongoing cooperation um, over the long duration of our, our, our work. Thanks again, and we're closing off International Perspectives. Thank you. Thank you.